Okay, sixth grade. Young Romulus will take the leadership, build walls of Mars, and call by his own name the people Romans. For these I set no limits, world or time, but make the gift of empire without end. From Virgil, the Aenid. Prologue. When the volcano first began to rumble, the birds of Rome could sense it. Seagulls swooped inland from the Mediterranean coast, shrieking their warning. The peacock, strutting around the Villa Borghese Zoo, pointed their beaks to the cloudless June sky and cawed, loud and insistent. The hooded crows, in their sleek livery of black and gray, rallied on the tile rooftops and crumbling walls to conspire and confer. They all knew that the, gods, the old gods were angry, that Vulcan, the god of fire, had issued a warning. His brother Mars, the god of war, had been whispering in his ear, complaining that the gray-eyed goddess Minerva, wise, fearless, strong, was meddling in the human world again. Both Vulcan and Mars were the sons of Juno, the great goddess of Rome. Their mother had never liked Minerva and favored daughter, the favored daughter of the mighty Jupiter, king of all the gods. Minerva was too all-knowing, too powerful, and even now, many, many centuries after her temples and shrines in Rome had been sacked, dismantled, buried, and built over, she saw the ancient city as her citadel, her domain. The brothers, seething in rage and suspicion, found an ally in Neptune, the god of the sea. Mars also called on the foul sisters, the harpies, to enter the city, ready to do his bidding. But, but Minerva had allies as well. Her brother Apollo and his twin sister Diana, both experts in archery. The Pleiades, the seven sisters, whom modern Romans imagined were nothing more than stars in the sky. And Mercury, the god's swift-footed messenger, who could travel across worlds and times and boundaries. When Minerva needed him, he was ready. On the frescoed wall of the Villa Far Farinzia, the nymph Galatea sends the reins in her, in her hand tug. The dolphins pulling her scallop-shelled chariot were moving. She felt the splash of a wave against her foot. Her red cloak billowing higher in the restless, as the restless Neptune whipped up the wind. But the three chubby cupids circling her were no longer pointing their bows and arrows at her. They raised their bows towards the sky poised for a different sort of attack. With every high-pitched, frantic cry, the city's hooded crows were telling, trying to tell the Romans, bustling about, that at any moment it would begin. The city's ancient streets soon would be engulfed, once again by darkness and war. But no one understood the old omens anymore. They'd forgotten that Juno ruled the peacocks in the Villa Borghese, and that the crows served Apollo, and that the vicious harpies, too, would take the form of birds. They'd forgotten that Rome was a playground and a battlefield for the gods. And when the gods were at war with each other, there was nothing anyone on earth could do to stop them. Chapter one. Laura Martin wasn't even meant to be in Rome that June. She should have been back home in Bloomington, Indiana, not hanging around the lobby of a cheap hostel with 11 other kids from Riverside High. The school's annual classics trip had almost been canceled that year due to low enrollment in the class. This irritated Laura. Classics was her favorite subject. She was planning on studying ancient history in college. Laura's best friend, Morgan, who was also on this trip with her, teased Laura that she only liked old things. Vintage clothes, vinyl records that had to be played on a turntable, used books that smelled of dust, black and white movies. Thankfully, their teacher, Mrs. Johnson, had petitioned the principal and gotten, approve, gotten approval for her to go. Every student had to pay his or her own way for the trip. That was no issue for Morgan's family. Laura had to babysit hyperactive toddlers, every, save every penny of a, a, each birthday, save every penny of birthday money, and work as a camera elf at Santa's Grotto in the mall over Christmas. But it was worth it. She had made it here, 12 days, three countries, Turkey, Greece, and Italy, and every day more interesting than the next despite the muggy heat and a succession of crummy hostels. Today marked the end of the trip. They'd spent the past two days in Rome, touring the Forum, the Pantheon, and the Colosseum. Now, on their last morning, Mrs. Johnson told the group that they could do anything they liked. 
Well, anything within reason, she cautioned, her voice hoarse from playing tour guide. Everyone stay out of trouble and be back here by six, please, for our special last night dinner. She winced and gripped her stomach, leaning against the lobby wall, as if the lurid orange wallpaper would give her support. I think we may be killing POTUS, Loris murmured to Morgan, trailing the other kids out the glass doors into the swampy heat. And that, after all, is a federal crime, said Morgan in mock earnest. All three teachers on the trip shared last names with former U.S. presidents, Mrs. Johnson, Mr. Harding, and Ms. Wilson. But only Ms. Johnson, Laura and Morgan had decided, was worthy of the title of President of the United States, States, otherwise known as POTUS, which was the school's sole classic teacher. Sometime during the long, hot overnight boat ride from Greece to Italy, the whole group had started using that nickname, though we were the ones to come up with it, Morgan liked to complain. Morgan was annoyed that she and Laura were basically ignored by the other kids on the trip. This was mainly because she and Morgan were the youngest. They would be starting their junior year in the fall, and everyone else was going into their senior year. It was obvious to Laura that there were three factions among, this, uh, among the seniors, the cool kids, the shoppers, and the geeks. The cool kids were the best looking and liked to brag about the sports they excelled at and the colleges they'd be applying to. The shoppers had the most money or just the most obvious desire to spend it. They preferred haggling for scarves in the Grand Bazaar in Istanbul to exploring the ruins of Pompeii. The, the geeks were the two boys, Dylan and Jack, who wore Star Wars t-shirts and complained about stupid things like the absence of lettuce and Greek salad. When POTUS talked about Virgil, one of the famous poets of ancient Rome, Dylan asked if she meant the Pokemon character of the same name. Laura didn't know why he was even on this trip. Ryan Cray and Dan Sinclair were the best looking of the cool boys. Dan had messy hair and chiseled cheekbones and seemed incredibly aloof. Ryan was blonde and loud and wore skinny yellow jeans that he thought looked like that he thought looked European. On the bus ride around Greece, Ryan had tried to get Laura's attention. The sun was in his eyes and he wanted her to her to close the pleated window curtain next to her seat. Hey, mutant girl, he shouted. Laura had dark eyes. Uh, dark hair and olive skin, and really she thought her eyes would have should have been nice and ordinary brown. Instead, they were gray and sometimes turned shades of blue and green. That's why Ryan called her mutant girl. I mean, at least that's, she thought that was why. She wished he'd bothered to learn her name. He's a guy who wears banana pants, Morgan had pointed out, trying to cheer her up afterward. Who cares what he thinks? Now, as she and Morgan headed down the narrow alley behind their hostel, Laura decided to stop caring about any of the other kids. This was her last day in Rome, beautiful ancient Rome. Laura had been dreaming about this city since she was a little girl when her grandfather would tell her stories from the end of the world. He'd been stationed here as a young soldier, just 18 years old. He said even with the rubble and the rats, it was his favorite city in all the world. Laura saw why. Rome felt like a mythical place, not at all part of any real world familiar to her. The world of strip malls, highways, and drive throughs back home. Now, everything she studied and read about in classics class this year was alive all around her, and in its fragmented and decaying beauty. It was also old, Laura kept thinking, though not daring to say it out loud. Before they'd left Indiana, POTUS had issued them with a what-not-to-do list, and anyone transgressing had to pay a two euro fine towards the official teacher's gelato fund. Prohibited behavior included saying everything is so old or this is awesome, as well as persistent dawdling, wearing earbuds during tours of ancient sites, or complaining if there wasn't air conditioning. There were so many possible transgressions that the teachers were pretty much able to buy themselves ice cream three times a day. Laura's own what not to do list would be slightly different, she decided. Ryan wouldn't be allowed to call her mutant girl. Students couldn't sit in their usual cliques every single night at dinner. Of course, various items of clothing would be banned. Star Wars t-shirts, banana pants, and the uh, fluffy sandals that the shopping girls insisted on wearing, even though they kept complaining about aching legs. Most important, Ms. Wilson, a.k.a. Woody, after her namesake Woodrow Wilson, 
wouldn't sing the theme music from the old movie, Three Coins in the Fountain, ever again. Follow me, Woody called now, leading them along another narrow street. She was the school's art history teacher and kind of chaotic, in Laura's opinion. When they hit a main road, Woody, blinded by the brightness of the sun, almost stepped into the path of a speeding Vespa. Why is Woody with us? Morgan whispered. Isn't this supposed to be our free time? She pulled her shoulder-length blonde hair into a high ponytail to avoid what she called the neck sweats when the heat of the day got too intense. Laura wished she'd gotten her long hair trimmed before they left Bloomington. During this trip, Morgan had insisted on trying out various Greek goddess styles on Laura's hair, and all that braiding and twisting just made it wavy and crazy. She's obsessed with the Trevi Fountain, Laura explained, brushing a stray dark curl out of her face. She wants to throw a coin in to make sure that she'll return to Rome one day. She could just buy a plane ticket, you know, like a normal person. Morgan made a face and Laura grinned. Although they were all given the eye, they were all given to eye rolling behind Woody's back. Most of the students were following her lead today and heading for the Trevi Fountain. Maybe, Laura thought. They were so used to doing everything together that going off alone seemed radical and strange. Just two of the shopper girls had broken ranks by going to the busy Via del Corso, and Ryan Banana Pants had stayed back at the hostel, complaining that he felt sick and achy. Laura and Morgan walked together, Laura snapping photos and Morgan posing. Their roommates, Nicole and Courtney, enthusiastic members of the shopper camp, were doing their best to incur fines for persist persistent dawdling. They kept stopping to gush over fake Prada and Gucci bags spread out on blankets in the street. The rest of the seniors walked in their usual clusters, engrossed in their usual private conversations. Occasionally, Laura thought she saw Dan look back at her, as though he was about to ask her something. But maybe this was just wishful thinking. He probably thought of her as mutant girl as well. Laura self-consciously smoothed down the front of her tank top. Walking up ahead alongside Woody was a strange girl named Maya, who joined them the day they arrived in Rome. She had sleek, short black hair and a cat-like face that would have been pretty if she hadn't spent so much time frowning. Apparently, Maya was going to be a new student, a senior at Riverside High in the fall. Her parents, professors of some kind, in Italy for an academic conference, had managed to talk the principal into letting Maya crash the end of the classics trip. Laura had tried to talk to her a few times, but Mystery Maya, as the other kids called her, wasn't exactly forthcoming. There were rumors that her parents were either exiled nuclear physicists or spies. Laura didn't know about that, but she did know that Maya had a long, multi-syllabic le Russian last name, and that she was born in Vladivostok, and that her parents, Russian father, Korean-Russian mother, were starting jobs at the University of Indiana, and that Maya tended to talk like a professor herself. The movie didn't make up the tradition of throwing coins into a fountain, you know, Ms. Wilson, Maya was saying, marching down the street alongside Woody. The ancient Romans threw coins into rivers and lakes as an offering to the gods to request a safe return from a journey. We'll be throwing our own coins in soon. Woody sounded almost breathless with excitement. Should we sing the song? <coughs> Maya ignored her. And the Trevi Fountain was built on the site of an underground Roman aqueduct, she continued. Well, the end of one, where it opened into a public square. Laura knew this. The aqueduct was built by Agrippa to supply water to his baths near the Pantheon. She wish, wished those baths were still there. But like so much of ancient Rome, it had been stripped or built over with oak until only piece of it, pieces of it were left. Someone please make her stop, Morgan whispered to Laura, fussing with her ponytail. Who, Woody or Maya? Both. This is supposed to be our day off, our last chance to have without having to learn anything or get asked the difference between, I don't know, Trajan and Trojan. Uh, Trajan's an emperor, said Maya, shooting an are you stupid look back at Morgan. Laura hoped she hadn't overheard all of their conversation. And Trojans were the inhabitants of ancient Troy. Oh yeah, silly me, said Morgan. She raised her eyebrows as Laura, at Laura as soon as Maya's sleek dark head was turned. Be nice, Laura whispered. You know, that's, oh, you know that stuff too, Morgan hissed, but you don't blab on about it, do you? I could recite the names of emperors for you again, Laura teased. Morgan had told her once that it was the best known cure for insomnia, Laura's chronological list of Roman emperors. 
can you really do that? Said a boy's voice to her left. And Laura realized it was Dan. She felt her cheeks burning. Don't encourage her, Morgan groaned. She didn't seem intimidated by Dan at all. Maybe because she claimed he wasn't that cute. It's the world's most boring party trick. The walk signal flashed at them and everyone set off across the street. Dan strode ahead with some of the others from his group, not waiting for Laura to reply. It was just as well, Laura thought. She didn't have anything particularly interesting or witty to say. Better to lose herself in the sights of the city. Rome looked like a stage set with its pale buildings, shuttered windows, and huge wooden doors with handles shaped like lions or snakes. When she looked up towards the bluest of the sky, of bluest of skies, she saw lush roof terraces lined with vine-colored trellises. Every narrow street seemed to lead to a cobbled piazza or to a serene stone fountain carved with dolphins or nymphs. And now, quite suddenly, they were approaching the most amazing fountain of them all, the famous Trevi Fountain, white and enormous, its tableau of muscular men and giant horses wedged against the wall of a palazzo like a multi-story altar. Its gushing spouts drowned out the chatter of the huge crowd of people around it, everyone taking photos and tossing coins into the frothy pale water. Laura had seen pictures of it before, but it was much larger and more impressive than she'd expected. More beautiful, too, as though it was carved out of the purest vanilla ice cream with such lifelike detail Seaweed, grapes, and reeds, petrified in bleached marble. Man, this is awesome, said Jack, plucking at the neck of his t-shirt. Luckily, Woody was too distracted to find him for using a banned word. She was already charging down the crowded stairs, making for the rounded rim of the fountain. It was entirely lined with people sitting with their backs to the water, throwing coins in over their shoulders. It's carved by Pietro Bracchi, uh, Woody shouted waving a spin spindly arm in the air. Such strong lines, such movement. Hey, Neptune looks like he's dancing, said Dylan, nudging Jack, and Maya shot him a bemused look. That's not Neptune, Maya said. That's Oceanus, the son of Gaia and Uranus. The, the men holding the horses back, they have fishtails, see? So they're representations of Triton, Neptune's son. Class dismissed, said Dylan, smirking, and Laura felt sorry for Maya. However much Laura and Morgan might feel like outsiders, Maya really was. Even the geek boys thought she was weird. Part of it was her insistence on supplying information all the time. Another part was her abrupt manner. Laura's mother talked about people who didn't suffer fools gladly, and Laura had never understood what she meant. Listening to Maya, though, she was starting to get an idea. Laura heard people burbling nonsense, and she just ignored it. Maya never could. That's right. That's right. Woody fumbled in her purse for a coin. The mighty tritons. Notice that one horse is calm and the other is restless? Well, what does that mean? Said Nicole, chomping on gum. POTUS would have made her throw it away, but Woody never noticed anything. Well, it's a question of balance of energy, isn't it? Gushed Woody in her overdramatic teaching voice. It gives dynamism to the composition. Laura stopped listening, squinting at the statuesque female figures in their carved draperies stationed either side of Oceanus. She checked her guidebook. The woman on the left was abundance, struggling with her cornucopia. The one on the right was health, which Laura decided was a very dull name for a woman brandishing a spear and keeping a wary eye on a writhing snake. The sun was so bright that Laura's head started aching. She fumbled in her bag for her sunglasses. The heat and the light were playing tricks on her, she decided, because for a moment, the snake seemed to be moving, slithering up the shapely arm of health. Laura shook her head, the way a dog shakes after running out of the sea. Sculptures couldn't move. Woody had managed to squeeze into a place on the fountain's edge, eyes shut, coin glinting in her hand. Oh, may as well, said Morgan with a resigned sigh. She pushed through the thick crowd until she was sitting on the edge of the edge as well back to the water, preparing to throw her coin. Most of the students were doing the same thing, Laura noticed, apart from Maya, who never seemed to join in with anything. Maya was frowning, hands shading her eyes, as the Triton brandished a conch shell. Laura, come make your wish, Morgan called, and Laura waved at her, smiling. It was true that she'd love to return to Rome one day, ideally without three teachers and 11 other kids. An insect brushed against her wrist, and Laura instinctively flicked her hand away to what flicked her hand to wave it away. 
And without meaning to, she smacked into the person standing next to her. Oh, I'm so sorry, she began, forgetting to say scusi or permesso or whatever it was they'd been told to say in Italy. And then she realized with the start that it wasn't an insect skittering across her skin, but another person's hand. The person standing right next to her, whose fingers were closing around Laura's bracelet, tugging at it so hard that the chain dug into her skin. Someone was trying to steal the most precious thing Laura had owned. No, she said with a trembling low voice. She was too astonished to shout. With her other hand, she grabbed at her own wrist to try to wrench it away from the mugger, clamping her fingers over the bracelet. Everything was blurred and hurried. Laura was pulling hard and elbowing whoever it was in the side. She wanted to scream, but she couldn't. Her heart was beating too fast, and all her energy was focused on pulling her arm free. All of a sudden, Maya was there, still frowning, and Maya shoved the mugger in the chest. With one final almighty effort, Laura pulled her arm free, the bracelet's chain broken but still sticking to her clammy arm. And just like that, the mugger melted into the crowd so quickly that all Laura got was the briefest glimpse. It was a woman, she registered, dark hair, dark eyes, pale skin, a mean expression as though Laura was the one stealing something. Thanks, Laura managed to wheeze, looking up from the broken bracelet dangling off her wrist. But Maya had already walked away down the steps toward the fountain as though this kind of thing happened every day. Laura realized she was shaking. They'd been warned about pickpockets. POTUS had told them to carry their bags strapped across their chests, not letting them dangle from shoulders. But Laura had never imagined someone trying to steal the bracelet off her wrist. Now, for the first time since they'd arrived in Rome, the sky seemed to be darkening. Gray clouds blocked the intense blue, and Laura was relieved. It was too hot, too sunny. She slipped the broken bracelet off and carefully stowed it in the zipped front pocket of her bag. The chain was silver and could be mended, she guessed. Luckily, the stone looked undamaged. That was the most important part, the part that had sentimental value. Grandfather, who had died when Laura was seven, had left it to her. Laura remembered him showing it to her once when she was very small, and he had told him she thought it was beautiful. It was beautiful, a grayish blue stone the size and shape of an almond. A star sapphire, her grandfather said, though it looked more like a polished pebble, Laura thought, shot through with its own tiny constellation. Her grandfather had picked it somewhere, picked it up somewhere overseas during the war. Her mother had made it into a bracelet when Laura turned 15, a year ago, and since then she'd worn it every day. It reminded her of everything she'd loved so much about her grandfather, his kindness, his strength, his stories, his smile. But with every passing year, Laura felt as though she could remember less and less about him and about the time they spent together. She wasn't even sure that she really remembered and what she'd heard from other people. It made her sad to think that someone that special to her could just disappear from her memory. That was why the bracelet was so meaningful. No way was someone ran, no way was some random thief going to steal it. Dylan clambered up the broad steps towards her, looking sweaty in his Star Wars t-shirt. Laura didn't know how he could bear wearing black clothes in this heat. Someone just tried to mug me, she told him. I think someone's mugged my head, he said. And Laura noticed how strained and pale his face appeared. He lowered himself to the ground and stuck his head between his knees. I, I feel like throwing up. Are you okay? Laura was concerned by his pallor. Should I get Woody? I, I should just go back to the hostel, Dylan muttered. Where's Jack? I can't believe all you guys are getting sick on the last day, Laura said, thinking of banana pants back at the hostel. The girls too, Dylan mumbled, and Laura looked down at the fountain's edge. Woody was standing up, frantically fanning Nicole's face. Courtney sat slumped on the ground, her eyes closed. Morgan was kneeling down, patting Courtney's head as though she were a puppy. It can't be food poisoning, can it? Laura asked. We all ate exactly the same thing for every meal yesterday. Maybe you have sunstroke. It's not very sunny now, Dylan raised his head, grimacing up at the gray sky. A rumble of thunder sounded in the distance, and everyone around the fountain seemed to ex exclaim in unison, excited at the prospect of rain after so much heat. Squawking seagulls zoomed overhead, circling the small piazza. There was something eerie about their cries, Laura thought, suppressing a shudder. She hoped that she wasn't getting sick with all this strange illness as well. It would make the long flight home even worse. Woody was shepherding kids up the broad steps, some of them looking barely able to stand up. 
Raindrops pattered down and thunder growled again, sounding closer this time. A storm was coming. One seagull dipped so low that its wing brushed Laura's hair. It shrieked loud and menacing right in her ear. She flinched, ducking to get away, but it circled back, ready to dive bomb her again. Laura scrambled up the steps. She needed to get out of the pier before she got drenched or robbed or smacked in the head by these manic birds. Morgan was beckoning to her and Laura shouldered her bag ready to follow. She looked, took one last look at the cool blue water of the fountain and stopped. Her eyes were playing tricks on her again. Laura could have sworn that she could see one of the horses moving. The rearing horse, the one on the left. It threw its giant's head back even further and churned the air with its front hooves. The carved triton gripping its mane was half pulled out of the water. Laura closed her eyes and opened them again. Could no one else see this? Was she hallucinating? It's raining, said a voice behind her. Mysterious Maya, we should go. D do you see anyth anything moving? Laura asked her. The rain was growing heavier and the crowd was beginning to scatter. You know, in the fountain. I saw that seagull launch itself at your head, replied Maya, giving Laura one of her quizzical looks. The Roman auguri auguaries would say that that's a bad omen. Whatever, said Laura. She wasn't in the mood for bad omens. She needed to find Morgan, get back to the hostel and lie down for a while until she stopped seeing stone snakes and horses moving. When in Rome, Maya called after her and it sounded more like a warning than a joke. Everything in the hostel was orange. The sinks in the bathroom were orange. The sheets on the bunk beds were orange. The desk in the lobby was orange for Micah. And the officious guy who worked there had such a livid fake tan that they dub dubbed him Agent Orange. Back in their shared room on the third floor, Morgan closed the garish orange curtains to block out the sun. The rain had stopped as suddenly as it had began. Courtney and Nicole were both lying on their beds, already half asleep. Actually, Courtney was lying on Morgan's bed because she was too weak to make it up the ladder to her own upper bunk. Laura couldn't believe how pale Nicole looked right now. I feel all shivery, she whispered to Laura before she closed her eyes, and I ache everywhere. Woody appeared in the doorway, brandishing bottles of water from the vending machine in the lobby. Laura took two and placed them within reach of her two sick roommates. That's six of you who aren't feeling well, Woody reported, including poor Mrs. Johnson. And a teacher from one of the European groups said most of her students are sick as well. In fact, she was feeling ill herself. It's like some kind of flu except the wrong time of year. So odd. But maybe everyone will feel better by tomorrow. I hope so. Otherwise, the trip home is going to be very unpleasant. Should we stay here this afternoon, you know, to take care of them? Morgan sounded as reluctant as she looked. She already changed into a white muslin sundress and was itching, Laura knew, to go out again. Laura was still in her slightly damp t-shirt and shorts, but figured she could change later. No, Woody said, her mouth dro drooping. Mr. Harding and I have agreed that we'll take turns on at keeping an eye on things here. You two go off and have a good time. Well, at least we're rid of everyone for a few hours, Morgan murmured to Laura as they set off down the hallway. Should we check out the graves? Laura had, all, Laura had really wanted to explore the ruins of Nero's golden house but it wasn't open to the public at the moment. So she didn't mind indulging Morgan, who was desperate to see the graves of the poets Keats and Shelley in the old Protestant cemetery. It wasn't part of their official classics trip itinerary. And today, as she'd reminded Laura maybe 10 times, it was their only chance. Hmm, said Laura, wondering if she should have left her broken bracelet in the room rather than carry it around in her backpack. Maybe with Nicole and Courtney staying in the room, the bracelet would have been safe but she'd rather have it with her in case she could get the chain mended somewhere. Let's make sure Jack and Maya don't see us and try to tag along. Morgan clattered down the narrow staircase. They probably wouldn't be interested anyway, or else Maya would know everything about it and bore us to death. Yeah, I guess, said Laura, though she felt bad scampering off like this. Sometimes it was nice just to be around other people, especially in a strange city, even if they weren't exactly your BFFs. As it turned out, there was no chance of escaping unnoticed. In the lobby, Jack was slumped like a rag doll in one of the orange plastic chairs, pulling on the cords of her, his Purdue hoodie. Maya sat huddled on the floor writing in her diary. She was frowning with concentration. She's probably writing, day three, still no friends, Morgan whispered, nudging Laura. 
Laura nudged her back even harder. You guys, we're going to get the Metro out to the Protestant cemetery, Laura announced. She ignored Morgan's fingers pinching into her arm. You can come with us if you'd like. Sure, Jack said. May as well. There's nothing else to do. Campo Sestillo? Asked Maya, slamming her diary shut. That girl really was like a cat, Laura decided. Self-contained, hard to read, almost insolent. She scrambled to her feet, dusting off her shorts. That's its correct name, you know. And with four of us, I think it'll be cheaper to catch a cab. Morgan slid, sighed theatrically. Just as I predicted, she hissed at Laura and pushed open the foggy glass door. Thanks for not listening to me. I never listened to you, Laura teased, hoping Morgan would cheer up. Outside, the afternoon air was humid, still heavy with the rain. She refused to let anyone spoil her last day in Rome. Not sulky Morgan or listless Jack or weird Maya. Not even marauding seagulls and brazen muggers or looming storms. This was the most amazing city that she'd ever seen in her life. A wash in history and stories and secrets. Who knew what they would un uncover this afternoon? All right, guys. That's a pausing stop right there. Um, hold on. Let me 